What we'll be talking about in the treatment is not, um, you're not going to see it as um, on-label treatments. Uh, we're dealing with patients where most of the treatments are off-label, and not every gastroenterologist does this. This is what occurs in referral centers uh, like at UNC, where we're uh, seeing patients who failed everywhere. So I'm going to take you quickly through what is the reason, the value for centrally acting treatments, and then what do we use? Uh, why do we use central treatments? They have high prevalence of psychosocial comorbidity. Here's data showing that among um, uh, IBS patients, you can see uh, many, up to 75% might have a psychiatric disorder. But that's a little misleading because um, this means this start means that you start to label patients as having psychiatric problems, but that's not true. It's the patients you see and study. And here's data from Bill Whitehead. We've done the same work to show that when you look at patients with IBS who have not been to the doctor, and in our study we adjusted for pain scores and diarrheal severity, that the psychologic scores are no different than normal controls. In other words, the, this is looking at SCL90. It's the patients you see who come to the doctor where the psychologic disturbance occurs. And that might be because those people have more severe symptoms, either because of parallel processes, that there's a brain and a gut phenomenon going on, or their symptoms are more severe, and that's leading to psychologic distress. So basically, it's the psychological disturbance that relates to the patients who see physicians, and they influence healthcare seeking. And that's why you can see in the referral centers much more severe patients than you might see in a GI practice than you might see in primary care. There's evidence that patients have an enhanced gut reactivity to stress. Here are two models done uh, with physical stress, uh, which I think was hand and ice water, and psychologic, which was dichotic listening, where you heard two different sp people speaking. And you can see that during the time of stress, the sensation threshold drops uh, close to 25 percent, and then, then it recovers in the IBS group, but not in the controls. We do know that symptom severity can relate to the psych disturbance. That's what I was saying. Um, here's evidence to show that um, the pain is, um, is, is higher. This is looking at two cohorts of patients with functional bowel, IBS, and pain, severe and moderate. And you can see that the pain scores are higher in the severe patients, almost by definition, but their sensitivities are not different, again, showing that this may be more of a central amplification process. And here we're looking at their psychologic scores as well to show that the more severe group has greater psychologic scores and greater utilization. So another thing we, we're starting to look at these days is cognitive bias, that is, and this opens the door to psychologic treatments. Cognitive bias means uh, how we uh, verbalize, think about things, and report them. One common theme is catastrophizing, and uh, this is a questionnaire that uh, we and others have used called the Catastrophizing Index. And if you're a clinician, you're seeing these patients come to you, this is a very common sense that you'll get They'll be, they'll be very negative, very pessimistic, and very helpless. It's terrible. I feel it will never get better. I worry, will it ever end? I can't do anything about this, doctor. You've got to help me. And concurrent with that are these questions about how much control you fe feel. A very simple question to ask your patient is how, comfortable, how much control do you feel you have over your symptoms? Give them a 0 to 6 or a 0 to 10. The less control they have, as shown in this data, the less likely they'll do better in one year. So catastrophizing predicts a poor outcome, as well as their ability, their perceived ability to decrease symptoms. Uh, and this is a fairly robust um, effect, 41% is the R square. It's associated with abuse severity, which is more stronger and, and lower educational attainment. The, the answer to this is this would be a patient that you'd want to refer for cognitive behavioral therapy. There are other cognitions that we call maladaptive. Some work that Bruce Nalaboff, Lin Chang has done is called GI-specific uh, anxiety, where you become almost conditioned to your symptoms. You get caught in a vicious cycle. Health anxiety, body symptoms in, in general, and selective attention. I'm going to talk about this at the next talk. 
And then there's evidence from the gut effects of antidepressants show support that uh, tricyclics tend to slow the bowel, both in controls and IBS people shown on the left, and SSRIs because they're serotonergic, it speeds up the gut the transit time, whereas noradrenergic agents slow down the gut. This is showing that tricyclic antidepressants can reduce signaling from the nerve. This is pelvic nerves of, um, of laboratory animals. Hypnosis can lead to uh, improvement in these, uh, can lead to changes in the cingulate cortex. These are individuals who are hypnotized, healthy subjects. Half were put, they were all put in the same 47 degree water. Half of them said this is very painful. The other half said this is not painful. The somatosensory cortex, which is the area that receives the intensity of the pain, was no different. But the, but the cingulate area, which is the noxiousness area and the emotional loading or the linkage to the emotional loading, showed that when they said it was unpleasant, as shown on the left, it got hotter. So the suggestion led to activation of the cingulate cortex. This is the work that Ford has done. He's done a lot of meta-analysis looking at psychologic therapies. And what you can see here is that there is benefit with the number needed to treat of around three to four. There's no real difference between the treatments as far as we could know. There haven't been really good studies that have compared types of treatments. And for the most part, I would recommend that what we do is uh, try to target it for this specific person. Here's the data from antidepressants. Um, there is uh, some heterogeneity. Overall, the effect is good. Let's talk a little bit about psychologic treatments. What are the kinds of psychologic treatments? Uh, CBT is one that we've, we've done our research with. Um, it's really used a lot with people who have catastrophizing uh, somatic anxieties. Um, these are the ones who may have um, anxieties about leaving the house. Uh, and, and what the therapist is doing is getting the person to look at what their thoughts and feelings are and get them to reappraise it through homework and exercise. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I get anxious every time I go to work. Uh, what is your fear? My fear is my boss is going to fire me, and then you have them appraise the reality of that, and that usually leads to greater understanding and a reduction in symptoms. Interpersonal therapy is addressing difficulties in relationships which might be triggering. This is very popular in England. Hypnosis is used in England and here at UNC with Ole Paulson, and those are relaxation. I'll take you through these. CBT as I mentioned, can often be tied to relaxation and stress management. You're starting to recognize that maybe a lot of your beliefs are things that have become conditioned from the past. Uh, when you were a young child, you may have been fearful of something, and now you don't need to be that way. So this is what's called the cognitive triad. Negative emotions lead to negative experiences, and that continues the cycle. These are our data looking at CPT. And you can see that there was about a 70% clinical response compared to a, a, um, a, uh, an educational control condition. Uh, the disipramine study was a little bit more complicated. In the intention to treat, there was a not significant effect, though there was a trend. But when you look at the per protocol, you're seeing significant effects. And the reason is because patients dropped out because of side effects. So you were enriching the population who stayed in the study. If you keep someone on it long enough, you have a greater likelihood of seeing benefit. Uh, psychodynamic is relationships between the therapist. Um, the, the therapist looks at the relationship between the patient and others, and sometimes even the therapist. We know with the psychodynamic therapy that there was significant uh, benefit. Uh, this was a study by Francis Creed, very similar to our study, using an SSRI instead of a tricyclic and using interpersonal instead of CBT. And they showed clinical difference. Uh, the other thing that was relevant was that there was improvement in healthcare so costs in the psychotherapy over the other two conditions. You get the treatment for 12 weeks or so, and then what you do is you leave with this knowledge and you continue to do well. That's very different from staying on a medication. And then hypnosis is this kind of relaxing, calming image. 
uh, you have the person imagine a calm river, refocus, no pain. They're focusing on their bowels, and this leads to a, a state of relaxation that they can use over and over again. Peter Warwell has had remarkable studies, um, remarkable results. Here's his first one, and, and the ones to follow have also shown benefit. When do you want to refer for psychologic treatment? Uh, we think that um, if they have moderate to severe symptoms, mild occasional IBS may not be as relevant. Uh, it is very helpful if the patient sees a relation of the stress to the symptoms. Uh, if there's maladaptive coping, that's a handle for the therapist and if they're motivated toward treatment. Um, we published a paper in the American Journal Gastro in 2010 to look at the, what were the predictors of CBT. And it, I think the translation of this into other conditions is generic. If the person believes that the treatment is helpful, if they feel that they can control their symptoms, we talked about that before, and if they have a good relationship with a therapist. So I think that transcends many types of treatment conditions. If they believe in the treatment, uh, believe in themselves and uh, they get along well with the therapist, it's likely to work. What are the red flags that you have to think about? If you're seeing a patient and you have some um, problems, uh, you worry about whether you should refer the person to a therapist, uh, these are the red flags and these are the Rome red flags. So if you look in the back of the Rome book, you'll see these flags and there are questions you can ask. Um, severe depression, that's suicidal, chronic refractory pain, severe disability, maladaptive illness behavior, uh, difficulties in the physician interaction, um, and other identifiable signs. These are not the red flags, I'm sorry. But these are other are the findings. The benefits of psychologic treatment is that you do get a good response. You can add it to the, to the patients who are getting medical treatments. Uh, there are no side effects and the benefits can continue. The limitations are that it requires uh, patient motivation. And a lot of what my job is and what your job should be is to get them to the point where they see the value of going to the therapist as something uh, complementary, uh, as opposed to uh, that you're referring them and then giving up the care. So you need to get someone who's trained and you, you work with the patient continue to work with them, you may or may not get reimbursement from third-party payers. What are the psychotropic agents in the last few minutes? So we have the antidepressants. Um, we have anxiolytics, and I will uh, mention something about azapurones or buspirone. Um, benzodiazepines are something that we often recommend in the short term, not in the long term. Um, there is growing interest in the antipsychotics, primarily from our group, but growing in other places, um, and we have done some work with quetiapine. Uh, if there's time, I can tell you about the data. And then there are also mood stabilizers. Remember, and this is something you can tell your patients, the gut neuro neurologic system is the same as the brain neurologic system. They come from the same onlaga. They differentiate with the um, embryo, and so the neurotransmitters are the same, and so you can use agents that are used in psychiatry in these conditions for various reasons. And so um, when you're talking about antidepressants, I would recommend that you think about the TCAs or the SNRIs. Uh, the reason is because the SSRIs uh, do not seem to have the same benefit for pain. They're mostly serotonergic, as shown uh, here. The TCAs have noradrenergic benefit, which I think you need both the noradrenergic and the serotonergic to achieve the benefit. And you can see that, that both the TCAs and the SNRIs have that. But the problem with the TCAs is that they also have side effects because they're so-called dirty drugs, a histaminic, antihistaminic effect, and anticholinergic effects, which can give you the side effects that we're all used to. So that's why I tend to prefer the SNRIs because of their, uh, their cleaner drugs. They do have side effects, as shown here. Uh, for the tricyclics, you're thinking mostly of sedation and constipation. For the SSRIs, more activating drugs, agitation, diarrhea. SNRIs is more pain. I'm oh, sorry, nausea. If you're going to use an antidepressant, a lot depends on how you present it to the patient. Patients, many of the ones you'll see in, in referral centers have been to many doctors. 
They don't fully understand why it's being prescribed, uh, and they may feel very negative because of the way it's been prescribed. Um, here's something you can try it or learn to relax. Here's something to help you relax. But using a physiologic model, going into the data about downregulation, the effect of these antidepressants can be very helpful. Other central agents that we often use would be mirtazapine, which has, is a complex drug, uh, but it is very helpful for nausea, weight loss, a lack of appetite. It's a sedating drug, can be associated with weight gain. There's a paradoxical effect that if you increase the mirtazapine, the uh, sedation tends to get better. Clonidine um, we can use for withdrawal from narcotics, but it also has alpha adrenergic agonists, central anti-anxiety effects, as well as reducing diarrhea peripherally. And buspirone is an augmentation agent. It's not a very potent agent as an anti-anxiety, but it does have benefit uh, to add to, the, to using other agents like SNRIs. And it also um, may have an effect on the, function, the, the functional dyspeptic patients. We've used quetiapine. We've published a case report. We just analyzed a, um, uh, a prospective study. Uh, when we haven't written it up yet. I can tell you we're seeing benefit with it. Um, like CBT, we're seeing benefit um, mostly in terms of global scores, uh, global improvement, reduction in anxiety. The pain scores are modest, but when we're adding it to the uh, antidepressants, we can usually get a good global response. The last thing I want to mention is something we had started to use, which is memantine uh, as a third-line agent for the more severe pain. Uh, this is used for uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, so it's an agent that leads to neurogenesis. We're also using it because it's an NMDA receptor antagonist, which is an agent that's used for the development of chronic pain through the dorsal horn and in the brain. So um, the other interesting thing is that there's one rat study uh, that showed that if you addict them and you give them this agent, they don't seek drugs as much. So I thought that was very intriguing to, to use, and so we've used that on occasion. Um, the last thing is to show that there are Benefits in combining antidepressants and psychologic treatments, which is something we uh, vigorously try to do because we may be hitting two areas of the brain, a more um, the prefrontal area, which is more the uh, executive area of the brain, uh, and the uh, more limbic area, which is where the antidepressants might be working. And this has been shown uh, in brain imaging studies as well. There also are clinical trials to show that the combinations work better. It's been shown with uh, headaches, arthritis, um, to my distress, not with IBS. And that's it. Thank you.